Welcome everyone to a quick video here. Um, on the go, obviously not in the office, so excuse our not as high definition audio and video. Computex virtual this year. Intel did not had much to say there. Uh, mostly one keynote of they are the best and something. AMD on the other hand, some things to present there. Uh, starting with mobile RDNA 2. Uh, which of course is nice, um, although yeah, battery life and stuff personally for me integrated, uh, how did they call it, APU or Fusion back in the day, a decade ago, more than enough for me, usually anyway, uh, not that much gaming, mm -hmm. only need some video encoder, obviously better than this bloody ULV Intel surface here that we are streaming from, so, so much too. Anyway, what is much more significant here, and also, yeah, um, AMD Advantage laptops, but they are, it is relatively good. Um, mobile Intel is not that bad and personally not getting NVIDIA for their binary only blob for Linux drivers. But of course, um, yeah, unfortunately on Windows performance numbers, AMD Advantage, yeah, question marks because NVIDIA mobile performance, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes a little bit ahead potentially, but anyway, what we are more for here is some rather unexpected thing for me at least. So they showed there between all this presentation that are of course much more newsworthy than most what Intel had to say. They just like, wow, well, just one, one more thing and pulled there a 3D stacked uh, silicon chiplet SRAM aka cache f uh, out of a Ryzen 5950X or 5900X. And what that means is, uh, let's just try to find that here probably somewhere. Ironically, uh, the most new theory probably somewhere at the end. And we had this, I made a previous video probably about a year ago when just Intel uh, just double and triple the buffers, stupid, right? When you have not much other innovation, even though this is somewhere of that sort. And so what they have done, uh, probably somewhere here, um, silicon or silicon with silicon interconnects and what this allows is, is tripling the caches and not like doubling but freaking tripling and of course with that also potentially vastly increasing performance they have here in some benchmark um, running paired with some Gears of War 5 demo with whatever GPU and clock speed fixed at 4 gigahertz 5900 x 184 FPS and their triple cache prototype managed 206 FPS, roughly 12% more. Of course, not only for gaming, also for our recurring theme here, compiling whole open source stacks here in just two and a half hours. That is of course a nice thing. And maybe also to some degree where the x86 innovation goes, recurring theme here, I mentioned this a couple of times, I have quite some doubts how much more Intel and AMD can efficiently improve performance in the x86 space due to the sheer complexity and, uh, of x86. But yeah, doubling, tripling the caches, of course, one way. And when you set this into perspective, then Apple's M1, by the way, chip on chip, right? So we also have here chip on chip, but AMD's most advanced or of TSMC, of course, much higher density and uh, then this, uh, it's probably ball grid ray, I guess, here. And comparing this cache wise, uh, Apple's M1 has a relatively large cache of 12 megabyte for the high performance cores. That is three megabyte per core. That is ironically more L2 cache, significantly more than x86 CPUs have. They have a large L3 cache on the AMD side, but only half a megabyte L2 cache here per core. So Apple there six times higher. And on um, 
Z node. I, I wonder also, also low, why is this significant? This is of course always the easiest thing, doubling, tripling the buffers and caches. That is always uh, the easiest thing to do if you have the silicon process and manufacturing and, and money, of course. So theoretically, there is more room of improvement because L2 cache, of course, significantly faster, but just Bruce force sledgehammer slapping on there vast amount because tripling right on the sand side we have on those high-end enthusiast desktop SKUs a whopping 72 megabyte of combined cache of L2 and L3 and this is tripling that L3 cache from I think 64 to 192 megabyte and but this is also crazy right this, there is a limit you cannot just like why don't they just like a gigabyte? I mean, obviously gigabyte, a little bit expensive, doesn't fit in there and stuff. But um, tripling the cache, only 12% more performance. I would also wonder whether AMD brings that to market. Theoretically, they could have a tick step there of year end um, between the models releases. So uh, before Sen for or something next year. It would be interesting to see whether they release that as um, end user SKUs before Sen 4 um, for a 12%, uh, not too shabby. Anyway, interesting stuff to come, but of course, Sen 4 will be as usual branch predictor, uh, other execution stuff, and so on. So, Sen 4 or whatever, in whatever steps they tick tock, they release that. Um, other um, improvements to come like IPC and so on and uh, DDR5. Um, what else do we have there? So yeah, AMD, ironically on their own website, they don't even mention that here. Um, the most interesting for me is only, but also yeah, I mean, one thing is showing us, hey, we have that soon on the other hand, it potentially delays purchases now if you always next big thing, six months, 12 months later, also on the other hand, supply is short anyway. So yeah, that's what they had there. RS6000, RDNA2 series, AMD Advantage laptops. Also, yeah, the chin, uh, I find this ridiculous. Um, the amount of, yeah, I'll just give us uh, 16 by 10 or 3 by 2. This is uh, like seriously high performance and whatnot. And then this uh, 16 by 9 displays. Uh. Anyway, yeah, Fidelity FX, they finally have super resolution. Uh, probably comparable, um, but not a gamer to NVIDIA's, uh, what was it there, DS, DS something, um, upscaling there for doubling the frame rate for um, put ray tracing shadows and stuff, volumetric shadows and so on, with uh, smaller resolution and upscaling that. I'm a little bit surprised that it take, took them that long. Otherwise, yeah, you don't find it here directly. Maybe there are somewhere between some other lines for me that is the most interesting use, but news, we also have this other stuff. So, um, yeah, comparing that, um, if Apple just scales the course up, that would, at this point of time, with the performance course for 16 cores, 48 megabyte, um, I think, Let's uh, maybe do we have probably uh, anyway somewhere like here at least. No, that is just the right size for you to read, right? So they have three megabyte per core if they make the idea 48, and if they have the 32, uh, 32 core skew for the Mac Pro eventually or something, then yeah, 96. But again, not directly comparable. Although I also wonder, similar to here, AMD, what I said earlier, you cannot just double and triple this stuff uh, on and on um, because uh, silicon core sizes and costs and so on, and also signal latencies, um, time um, it takes for the signals to pass from, from one side to the chip to the other. So certainly Apple needs to also do much more innovation, maybe even also at a, rather at an L3 cache than just having this vast amounts of L2 cache. The three-dimensional stacking is not new. This was already researched in 
the 80s and 90s, even in, in Germany, Siemens, Fraunhofer, here, 80s, 90s, uh, Japan, Germany, Europe, USA, and uh, one of the earlier applications, surprisingly, was, at least there, there are different things, there is um, stacking that with Bohr grid arrays, silicon on silicon, um, and so on. Of course, they're not directly comparable, but the PlayStation Portable, surprisingly, one of the earlier examples of 3D stacked eDRAM, embedded DRAM, uh, Toshiba 3D system in package, two dice stacked vertically, and uh, semi embedded DRAM, and other applications, of course, um, AMD's own high bandwidth memory, of course, a lot of stuff in between. Um, of uh, SK Hynix and um, what you find uh, nowadays, even still with HBM2. So that, that's coming to your Ryzen, your Sun cores, potentially sooner than later. Really interesting stuff is also a cut through graphic card that uses high bandwidth memory. This is also similar to what looks on the Apple M1 there with a stacked DRAM. And uh, the difference here is just that it's way finer more um, so direct silicon on silicon as far as understood that without any um, ball, ball there much finer pitch higher frequency lower power and so on so on. amazing stuff uh, will be interesting to get hands on those uh, epic or thread gripping or Ryzen because performance is certainly something we need as well as I need obviously some more high performance in this bloody aging surface also yeah software gets more complex web gets more complex you can't even barely freaking browse the web with latest firefox here on a aging surface so much to probably um one lesson learned the last years i will probably never again buy a tablet or ultra thin and light stuff because at the end of the day performance performance or the lack thereof and then yeah, being creator, writing code or YouTube stuff and then can't even freaking live stream. Anyway, that is uh, the summary of this Intel. Oh, yeah, Intel, as I said, Intel had them mostly 45 minutes off. It's like, yeah, we are the greatest uh, by our products. Everything is amazing. And oh, we have stock. And yeah, anyway, that is the Intel side. If I, for if I forgot something, leave it in the comments below if you have more details or uh, questions on the AMD or other stuff. Um, yeah, also uh, one, one more thing, probably maybe there is this AMD power shift, not sure, power shift meaning somehow balancing power between CPU and GPU if you have this AMD advantage stuff here and um, not sure how much that works as usual. Asterisk is like, yeah, depending on driver availability might work a little bit on Windows, maybe even less on Linux, um, which is like, yeah, probably for our use case of mobile software development and live streaming. Probably I would simply prefer the Fusion APU there, integrated graphics, probably enough for YouTube live streaming, certainly not for AAA gaming, but on the other hand, less bulky laptops and um, yeah, not ultra thin and light, somewhere in between of stuff that you can carry, but you also have some battery life for some hours of coding. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you learned something. Don't forget to share, like and subscribe and I need to work on improving our mobile YouTube studio setup. See you next time.